Welcome, everybody. It's great to have so many people logged in right on time. Um, this marks the beginning of the 2022-23 fellowship year, so we're going to have a lot of new faces. Um, and uh, just thrilled to have everybody on board. And again, you know, the goal of this conference is for fellows to be able to interact with experts in the field, to, to ask questions, to make it interactive, and also to sort of build community amongst our, our West Coast spine community. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to just ask um, Greg or Bob to, to briefly introduce Dr. Sasso, um, and then we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sasso. Well, I'll take... Uh... I'll take, I'll take the opportunity. So um, Rick is a friend and a colleague and, uh, and has done an amazing job um, in, in at least my career of showing us exactly um, the balanced way to approach the cervical spine and in particular arthroplasty. Um, it, it was a controversial topic for a long time. And I think um, Rick is one of those guys that brought arthroplasty to the field and made it so that everyone kind of has a balanced understanding of when and when not to do it. Um, he's not one of those guys that jumps overboard and does it on everybody and is also not one of those guys that's afraid um, uh, to take on a challenge um, like this topic. And if you look at his CV, it's just a, a laundry list of, um, of publications um, on this topic. And he's certainly the world's expert in this field. And um, I've, uh, I think I've heard a version of this talk in the past and I have to tell you, it's like literally like top three talks I've ever heard in my career. And I am so happy to have you on board here, Rick, to share with our fellows, um, across the West coast about, um, these uh, tips and tricks towards arthroplasty and, um, such an honor to have you here. Thanks Rick for being here. Thank you, Greg. It's one awesome. of the nicest introductions I've heard. Thank you. So, Dr. Sasso, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Let's see if this works. Can you see that okay? Got it. Yeah, we're good to go. Okay. So over the next 20 minutes, and I, lo I love this title. Thank you for giving me this title because um, it allows me in a very short period of time to sort of give you my thoughts about cervical arthroplasty that I've learned over the last 20 years. So I uh, put in the first um, cervical disc replacement in the U.S. now 20 years ago in May. And this talk is going to be about not a specific disc. It's not, um, it's, it's completely agnostic to, to any specific artificial disc, but it's what I've learned and, and how I do things differently as opposed to an ACDF. I will still tell you an ACDF is my most favorite operation. Um, but I mean, and, and you'll see that arthroplasty can be, can be a really good operation as well, but there are some very specific things that are different. And I'm gonna hopefully share with you those, those differences and how I think um, differently. So we're gonna end this with a sort of uh, tips and pearls, but we're gonna start with some indications that I have found very, very difficult and where, where I would tell you be very wary. And, and the first indication is um, approaching C67 in a gentleman, a big barrel chested guy with a short neck. So this is an intraoperative uh, x-ray where I'm thinking I'm going to do an arthroplasty C67, and I can't even see the back of the C5, C6 disc space. And I will tell you, this is the most common reason that I have had to call an audible and change my plan from an arthroplasty to an ACDF. It is my opinion that in order to safely put in an arthroplasty, we need to see the back of the disc space. We absolutely have to visualize the back of the disc. Whereas in an ACDF, we don't need to do that. We basically <laughs> just need to be able to count down to the right level. So, so um, it, the, the ACDF I think is, 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 is much more uh, for, forgiving. And so, just be careful in these uh, big chested guys about doing C C67. And another very difficult um, uh, application is, is, an, is an arthroplasty in any type of deformity. No matter where you put this artificial disc, whether it's at the apex of the deformity or even outside the deformity, you're not gonna be very happy with, with your, your outcome. And you're gonna be looking at this 
uh, for the rest of your career, scratching your head saying, hmm, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. The, the other uh, problem that I've seen is in what I call bone formers. So patients that lay down a, a lot of bone. And I'm going to show you a case that, 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 that I just did in the last year where you see this big uh, osteophyte here anteriorly, but his problem was actually at the level below this at C5-6. And he actually had a large disc herniation causing, causing myelopathy. So I thought, yeah, I think I should be able to do this. This is a Bagheera disc. This is one of the current uh, FDA IDE trials that, that we're involved in. Um, it's a titanium, which is coated with a um, diamond car carbon um, coating. It's actually a really cool looking disc. It's black, like Bagheera the, in, in uh, the, the movie um, that my little girls watched when, when they were growing up. But, but um, the, the case went great. His myelopathy got better. But a year later, uh, I just recently saw him back, he started developing symptoms again. And you see here posteriorly, he's, he, he's laying down some bone at, at, at his success points here. And, you know, I scratch my head thinking, you know, this maybe wasn't a great idea in a guy that tends to lay down a lot of bone. So um, again, be very wary about these patients that lay down bone. And the Europeans um, showed us a long time ago that if you don't take, and we'll talk about this in a moment, if you don't take the posterior longitudinal ligament, that has a tendency to calcify, especially when more motion occurs. So another reason why we need to take the PLL, especially in, in patients that lay, lay down this bone. And the last uh, issue, the last potential problem that, that I've seen is putting in a, an artificial disc uh, next to a multi-level fusion. We, we do know that Adjacent to a one-level fusion, this is a, a, a very, very reasonable I, idea. But in arthroplasty next to a multi-level fusion, I've seen way too many problems and failures in, in the past. So I would, I would highly encourage uh, you to, to think about this strongly uh, before putting an arthroplasty next to a multi-level fusion. All right, so what I'd like to do is share with you just some tips and pearls um, that I've learned over the last two decades and how I do uh, arthro this arthroplasty operation different than I do in, in ACDF. And it starts with positioning the patient uh, in the operating room. We'll talk about how I define uh, the midline. I'll tell you, it's not with x-ray. Uh, how in important it is and how I place the patient parallel to, to the disc space. We talked about PLL resection, uh, non for, for two weeks to prevent heterotopic ossification. Then we're going to end with a little discussion about end plate uh, preparation. So the number one uh, difference in seeing is that when I do an ACDF, I put a roll under the shoulders. I think probably most of us do. It actually tilts the chin back. It opens up the, 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 the approach area. But what that does, if you're doing an arthroplasty, it actually puts the segment potentially into a hyper, hyperlordotic position. And we have a tendency then to resect more of the posterior end plates. And so what happens then uh, the uh, arthroplasty can actually cavitate a bit posteriorly and cause shell ky kyphosis. And that shell kyphosis can look very ugly and I hate looking at a, a kyphotic shell. So it's, it's important that we keep the neck in a neutral position and not a hyperlordotic position. So that requires that the towel is placed under the neck rather than under the shoulders. The concept is we want the back of the head and the back of the shoulders to be on the same plane in a, in a neutral position. Now, when you do that, it, it does have a tendency not to get the chin out, out of the way, and especially in big barrel chested guys. Again, this corridor can be relatively narrow. So, so, so again, in big chested guys, the, the approach itself can, can be hard. It, it, it can be difficult again, because we don't want to hyper lordose this, this segment. So the second thing that is different uh, for, for me is how I define the, the midline. I don't make any bogey marks at all in, in, in my approach until I'm on the target disc. Um, and I, I don't determine the midline by x-ray because it can fool you. X-rays, AP x-rays will lie to you all the time. So most of these patients are not do not have a significant amount of bone spurs and osteophytes. So the front of the cervical spine is usually fairly pristine. 
the longest coli muscles are, in my opinion, the best way to help define them. And it's, it's like looking at, at the goalposts and, and kicking, a, kicking a field goal right between the goalposts. So I take my, my bovie, the first time I use a bovie, and just make a mark from the target disc up to the disc above, uh, in the midline, and the same down caudally to, to the disc below. And then this defines my midline. And actually, then when I do the discectomy, I'm also then looking at the uncle vertebral joints. This is really what helps us define the midline is the uncle vertebral joints, not the spinous processes on, on an x-ray. In fact, I don't use x-rays to define midline. The only AP x-ray I get is at the end of the operation. And really, again, I'm not looking at the spinous processes. I'm looking at the uncle vertebral joints and making sure that my implant is centered between the un uncle vertebral joints. The problem with the spinous processes is that many spinous processes are not directly in the midline. They're off one to one side or the other, and it can confuse you a, a whole lot. So then once the midline is determined, placing the distractor pin, and, and you want absolutely the pins to be parallel to the disc base. And the best approximation of that parallel to the disc base is the cephalad end plate of the caudal vertebra. So I yeah. place the caudal pin first and you want to get it as far away as possible from the from the target disc again because depending upon what disc you're using you, you may have a lot of tools and things inside the disc space so you want your pins as far away as possible but i approximate this um end plate with this first pin that's that's cardly and i do get a lateral x-ray so i start the pin and i get a lateral x-ray to make sure that i am absolutely parallel to that to, to that end plate. And then once this caudal pin is placed and I place the cephalad pin again, as far away from the disc space as possible. And I place it parallel to the first pin that I put in. Now these pins should be parallel to, to the disc space and everything runs, runs off that pin. Um, many of these systems have uh, these little uh, threaded um, connectors that go onto the cast bar distractor pins to keep the uh, distractor from migrating up, uh, up off the top of, the, of these pins, which can be a problem. But actually what I found is that the bigger problem is it, what that does, it transfers then the force to the cast bar distractor pins and then the pins plow out through the vertebral body. So I don't use these little threaded uh, uh, connectors to keep the uh, the cast bar uh, distractor down. I, I'd much rather replace the cast bar distractor than have the pin plow. The other thing that I do differently is that when I'm doing an ACDF, I get my distraction off my, my pins, but we want to be uh, knowledgeable that these pins can plow. And so what I do is I use an, an intervertebral distractor to get my distraction and then keep it uh, keep that distraction with, with the pins. I don't get the distraction with the pins. I use the, the paddle distractor that, that most of these systems have. And then, as, as we talked about earlier, um, when I'm doing a, a ACDF, I take the PLL down on the symptomatic side. I want to make sure there's no, you know, most disc fragments are between the annulus and the PLL, but you can get a disc fragment posterior to the PLL. So, uh, I always take the PLL on the symptomatic side, and usually I don't take it on the asymptomatic side when I'm doing a fusion. But with an arthroplasty, I completely resect the PLL, again, because of this tendency uh, with motion occurring here for the PLL to calcify. And I've actually seen that in, in one horrible case early in my career where I didn't take the PLL on the asymptomatic side, and they quickly, within a year, developed symptoms on the asymptomatic side and I revised it and the PLL uh, was just completely calcified and causing all sorts of issues. So I take the PLL um, uh, on, on both sides and make sure that I, that I resect this uh, completely across the, the disc space um, when, when I'm doing an arthroplasty. Um, and then I use two weeks of non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. I don't do this in my fusions, obviously, but in my arthroplasties I do. And it has been shown to prevent heterotopic ossification that you see here that, that can be you know, a very disturbing issue for us. Um, our goal is, is, is to uh, retain motion. And we, when we see this, uh, you know, this heterotopic ossification completely across the disc space, it's, it's concerning. And there is some good data that two weeks of non-steroidals and 
if they don't have their favorite non sort I, I tell them a leave over the counter a leave tw twice a day. I'd like to spend our last few minutes talking about end plate preparation. Super important to understand that the disc base is not a trapezoidal structure. It's actually more like a football, uh, especially along the caudal end plate, right? The cephalid end plate of the, of, of the caudal vertebra. Because of the uncovertebral joints, it is, it is elliptical and it's like it, the, in, in, an ellipse and it's not flat. And especially in some patients that may have some ossifites medially in uncle vertebral joints here, this can cause a lot of issues when we try to place a, um, uh, an arthroplasty that needs to have a very solid foundation that is parallel to, to the disc space. And what you don't want to see is a situation like this. And I can tell you exactly what this guy did be, be, because it's so predictable. He was standing on the contralateral side trying to decompress the opposite side. And he really did a really good decompression over here, resected the, the osteophytes and uncle cubal joint, but ignored this side. And artificial discs aren't very smart. They, they go to where the least resistance is, and especially this specific artificial disc in OBC. I mean, it just goes in where, where there's least resistance. And because he resected this side very, very well, guess what? It slides over there, it opens up, and it compresses on the side where he, he, hasn't, he has not de de um, leveled off the uh, cephalot end plate of the caudal vertebra. And this will make you want to throw up for the rest of your life when you see this on an x-ray. So what we need to do is flatten this area. And how I do that, in every case I do it with a barrel burr, this burr is not a cutting, is not an end cutting burr, it's a side cutting burr. And actually it doesn't even cut. The, the burr spins opposite the, the way the cutting flutes are. So it's a smoother, it smooths and the, the end plate. And I place it in the midline and then just take it out laterally on both sides to equally flatten out the medial aspects of the uncle joint to allow my uh, arthroplasty to have a very solid foundation. As you see right here, I just go place the midline and just go lateral, medial, lateral, medial, lateral to, to flatten out the uh, medial aspects of the uncle vertebral joint. Um, and oh, I don't know why I did that again. Uh, okay. So um, also, I think it's super important. I, I know all of you will see sort of these expanded indications for arthroplasty. And I, I would tell you that that's where I've seen problems is when we try to exp expand the indications for cervical arthroplasty. We have great data, FDA, I, IDE, uh, level one, now even level 1A data. That means meta-analysis of, of level one data that show great results, but that's because the indications in, the, in these FDA trials were very, very narrow. And as long as you stay within those guidelines, I think you're gonna have a great outcome with your arthroplasty. Yeah, for, school, buddy. for me, single level focal disc herniation, unilateral causing radiculopathy in a young patient with normal facet joints and no significant degenerative changes at the target level or the adjacent levels. And if you stay with these within these indications, you're likely going to have a very, very good outcome with your with your arthroplasty. So again, thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to to, to be here and speak with you. And hopefully, uh, I've hit my 20 minutes here, and we have about 10 minutes to uh, to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Hey, Dr. Sasso, this is Jay Kumar, one of the San Diego fellows. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, one thing I've seen from attendings I've worked with and in lectures, conferences, et cetera, is that uh, attendings, especially when they get out and practice, get extremely excited about these arthroplasties and they do them a lot. And then they get sad because they fuse anyway. <laughs> um, any uh, technical or other tips to prevent that? You mentioned a few certainly good patient selection with bone formers, resecting the PLL, and then post-op NSAIDs. Um, any other patient selection or technical notes about the surgery itself? Do you use bone wax, et cetera, or any other ideas? I don't use bone wax. I know a lot of people um, talk about bone wax. Um, 
you know, I, in, in the, you know, the, the thought is, well, you know, if we, bur you know, a lot of people don't burr at all when they're doing an ar arthroplasty because they're worried about the, the bone dust. I will tell you that to me has not been an issue at all. And going back to my initial experience with uh, Brian disc, I mean, we milled the end plates with a milling device. We had a lot of bone dust around I and mean, you just irrigated out. I did not see a significant increase in heterotopic ossification. Our, our US IDE trial, the Brian disc, did not have a significant uh, in the, uh, high incidence of, heter of heterotopic ossification, although the Europeans did. And again, the Europeans did not use uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications for, for two weeks. And in the FDA IDE trials in the US where they did not use non steroidals they actually had a relatively high incidence of HO, and, and <coughs> especially the ProDisc C had a very, very high incidence of HO, but they did not mandate non uh postoperatively. So I think much more important uh, than bone dust is the use of non for two weeks. And again, as you said, patient indication. Um, I mean, I, I get so concerned now if I see a patient who has a lot of anterior osteophytes because like you say, you, you don't want to be sad. You, you don't want to see uh, that, that segment diffuse. And the case I just showed you, which I I just saw this guy just a, a few weeks ago, a year afterwards now, is developing a lot of osteophytes posteriorly now from his facet joints. Thanks so much. Do any other fellows have questions for Dr. Sasso? I actually do. Um, this is Amber, one of the other fellows at San Diego. Um, I always, they always talk about, you know, uh, neck pain and, you know, you don't want to do this in a patient who has prior neck pain, but I feel like that's so vague sometimes. Um, is, how do you kind of evaluate that and um, kind of make that determination in the clinic when you're looking at your indications? Yeah. So Amber, that's a great question uh, because again, the IDE trial was all radiculopathy, right? So not axial neck pain, but many patients have neck pain in association with their radiculopathy. And, and in fact, when you talk to a patient and they say they have neck pain, a lot of times it's sort of like neck pain, right? It's like shoulder neck. I mean, it's like right here and they call it neck pain, <laughs> but, but actually you need to publish, you need to publish that, on schneck pain. <laughs> that's, their, that's their ridiculous pain. You know, so yeah. You know, spine surgeons, we get all excited about what's going on distally, right, in their hand. Where's your pain? Where's your numbs and tingling? And most of them say, okay, doc, quit asking me about what's happening in my hand. That's not my main problem. My pain is here. And proximal pain, I mean, of, of all ner nerve roots, um, their dynatome or, or the painful pattern is proximal. And it's very, very difficult to determine approximately which nerve root it is, right? And that's why we like to talk about what's happening in the hand because it helps us determine which nerve root is the problem. Um, but a lot of times they're hurting in, in, in their neck, but that many times is all radiculopathy, radiculopathy pain causing that neck pain. And how I determine that is, is many times with a selective nerve root sleep injection. So if you do a selective nerve root sleeve injection, it makes all their pain go away, including their neck pain. Well, that's radicular pain. And they're going to do great with any operation that decompresses um, that nerve root and then puts that nerve root in the best environment to recover, whether, whether that's a fusion or, or, or an arthroplasty. So if I have a patient who I think has a radiculopathy but has a lot, a lot of neck pain, uh, I will uh, have my non-operative guys do a selective nerve root sleeve injection to determine that. Awesome. Thank you. There, I'm one of the fellows at Cedars. My name is Justin. Um, I was just wondering, what is your indication and how do you decide who's going to do well from a hybrid fusion? Yeah, I, I will tell you, I don't do a lot of hybrids. And the reason is, is that I'm not so sure I'm smart enough to, to be able to answer that question. And I will tell you that the vast majority of arthroplasties or even ACDFs that, that, that I do 
are single level. And, and the reason is, is that I work really hard to figure out exactly where their pain's coming from. Even though radiographically, they may have two levels that look bad, the vast majority of these patients only have one nerve root that's causing their, their symptoms. And so if I'm thinking about it in, in arthroplasty and I can figure out which one of those two disc, disc spaces uh, is causing their symptoms, um, I will not do, even though there, there may be some radiographic changes at that next level, in arthroplasty, we, we will hopefully, at least theoretically, decrease the incidence of that pro progressing. And I've got some cases now, in fact, I'm going to be presenting uh, at a conference coming up, a 20-year follow-up on a patient who had exactly what, what I just talked about. Five, six, six, seven, both look bad. Um, she had clearly a C7 radiculopathy. I documented that with a suck of nervous sleep injection. I did an arthroplasty only at six, seven and left five, six. And 20 years later, actually five, six looks better than it did um, 20 years earlier. And she's never required any operations at that five, five, six level. So I think that's, you know, I, I would much rather get away with a one level operation uh, no, no matter what it is, whether it's an arthroplasty or fusion, as opposed to doing two levels. So anyway, that's my answer to, to, to hybrids. But I, I get the fact that a lot of people are doing hybrids and, and the outcomes can, can be very, very good. Thank you. Dr. Staff, so we had a question from Dr. Chapman in Seattle about preferences for more versus less constrained ADRs and if that's changed in your practice or in your preference over the years? Oh boy. Yeah, that's a great, 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 great question. I will tell you that I would have said initially that, you know, unconstrained implants are, are, are good, but I will tell you, I think I've run into a, an arthroplasty that is much too unconstrained and I've seen way too many complications and problems from it. So I do think that, that you can have too much unconstrained. Um, and that, that was that case I, I, I showed earlier. I mean, uh, Moby C's, I mean, they, you know, you, you, they just go in where, where the least resistance is and they're very, very unconstrained. And I think that, I mean, I think you can have good outcomes with them, but, but I've seen way too many problems with them, frankly. Great. Okay, well, we're coming up on the hour. Does uh, anybody else have any additional questions before we let Dr. Sasso go? Awesome. Dr. Sasso, thank you so much. This was perfect. I think it's going to be really helpful for our fellows as they get ready for their own practices to kind of learn from your experience over the years. And um, Look forward to seeing everybody back next month and there'll be more to come and, and uh, more emails in your inbox, but have a great weekend, everybody. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Sasso. Thanks, Thanks Ray. Great honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank awesome you. Work. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks, buddy.